All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to one of our regular uh, webinars that we provide on a bi-monthly basis. I'd like to welcome all of our regular and new attendees. My name is Michael Trumper. I'm one of the principals here at Intabor Institute. I've been in the area of uh, project and risk management and software development for almost 20 years. Uh, Intabor Institute is the developer of Risky Project, which will be the software we're showing today. Uh, we've been in business uh, since 2002 and released our first version of Risky Project in 2004. Uh, we have and still continue to develop the software to keep up with the latest developments in project risk analysis and management. And the software I'll be using today is version 6.1, uh, which was released in early 2015. Generally, our webinars are a fairly informal presentation on popular topics or features that our users have asked us to uh, provide a webinar about or more information. Today's webinar is the step-by-step -step schedule risk analysis with Risky Project. This will be an introductory or entry-level discussion on how to perform a schedule risk analysis and some of the issues you need to consider uh, before and during your um, schedule risk analysis. Before we begin, Just going to do a little what we call housekeeping. Um, once you log in, you should see look up uh, at the top right. You'll see at your panel. Um, you can select the, your uh, audio. I always recommend using the computer mic and speakers if you have that. Um, uh, the quality seems to be better. There's a questions panel. Uh, so during the presentation. If you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to enter them in here. Um, and as we go on, uh, we'll keep track of those questions that come in, but we're not going to answer unless they're of a technical issue. Uh, you can't hear. Um, <laughs> they, the, they're, you're not able to connect very well. Um, something that we might be able to help you out with. Uh, other than that, we're going to be answering the questions at the end of the presentation. So I'll go through the presentation, uh, then I'll take a look at any questions that we have, and if there are any questions, I'll answer them at that time, uh, and then we'll end, it, end at that point. So we'll have a little time for a Q&A at the end. I'm hoping that this will run between 35 and 40 minutes, that's the regular length, and uh, so we'll have a little uh, time at the end for that. Um, and as always, uh, afterwards, we'll, we will be recording the presentation and we'll be posting that on our website, uh, normally within 48 hours after uh, the completion of this live broadcast. So, steps for schedule risk analysis. Um, I've sort of broken it down into five steps, high-level steps, uh, setting the objectives, adding uh, uncertainties or risk. I sort of might flip this over into uh, schedule quality, running your simulations, and generating reports. Now, the setting objectives part is really about why are we doing this, uh, uh, what are you trying to get out of it, and, um, and that will set the stage for all the other um, uh, aspects of what you were going to be doing. So when we say the objectives, it's uh, where are you at on your project schedule? Uh, during the planning phase, uh, it could be setting, uh, you're going to be doing a schedule risk assessment to set the, a realistic, most likely duration. So you might have your project plan, run the simulations, see that uh, the most likely, the mode, uh, might be have shifted uh, significantly, uh, so you might want to take that uh, schedule, generate a schedule out of the mode or the mean, and send that back in and create a new baseline. 
it also could be uh, used as part of this setting calculating schedule margins based on confidence levels. Uh, so once you've gone in and you have your project plan, uh, you put your project plan in place and now you want to be able to, you have your most likely, but then you want to be able to set uh, realistic schedule margins, not just plus or minus or, you know, plus 10%, uh, but something based on a, on a true model with uh, real uncertainties that you've entered into a, a schedule. Um, again, at the planning phase, we can then take from the data, we can take that and we can generate schedule margins either at the project level or at various uh, key project objectives. We can add schedule margin uh, into the project so that we have a, uh, I'm going to say, we have enough margin in the schedule that we're going to be able to deliver on schedule. During the execution phase, we can start to use a schedule risk assessment to understand how project performance impacts confidence levels. Uh, so we're looking at histograms for cumulative probability. Uh, in that terms, we're starting to, if we're looking at that, we're starting to see if there's any erosion in our P80 estimates. So as we, uh, as we get into project execution, are we seeing that the, the P80 dates might, this might be an example that you might be, is it, how, is it shifting to the, to the right? Um, how much is it shifting to the right? So we were, we had a, uh, a P, P80, sorry, which would be a 80% um, confidence level that we will deliver at that date or before. Um, is it eroding? So if we had a report, let's say a quarterly report, in uh, June that said we were going to deliver at, um, let's say, the March 31st of the uh, next year, and then we run the next quarterly, we see now that our P80 is shifted to the middle of April. So it starts to give us some measures about how that uh, actual project performance is starting to shift our confidence levels of being able to deliver uh, at certain dates. Uh, identifying key drivers, so sensitivity reports uh, or tornado reports. Uh, so when we're doing that, we want to be able to see what's, uh, what the actual impact on our schedule, or maybe on critical path or near critical activities, how they are impacting our ability to deliver uh, uh, or meet critical milestones, and identifying which activities to report on. So are we going to, when we're in the middle of uh, project execution, we're going to, which, what, uh, what activities are we going to report? It's going to be ones that uh, are critical, critical activities. Is it going to be specific milestones or deliverables? Um, so these are the sort of things that we want to understand when we're performing an SRA. Next part is schedule quality. Uh, in order to perform a schedule risk assessment, you have to have a, a reasonable or a good quality schedule. What, and what does that mean? Uh, good quality schedule means that it will update um, if you make a change in the project schedule to a duration, a start or finish time, that the rest of the project updates correctly. And to do that, you have to have a very good precedent network. Um, we often use a DCMA 14-point analysis. We'll actually look at part of that uh, analysis looks at what we call dangling links or uh, circular logic. So we, when we're looking at this, we want to be able to make sure that that schedule is um, has a high quality. So that means minimal use of constraints. And when we say minimal use of constraints, we mean hard constraints. So really, everything should be as soon as possible. Uh, set to constraints should be set to as soon as possible unless you have a really good business reason and there are some. Um, if we have hard hard constraint states then the project is not going to update correctly. Um, we want to use maybe project or task deadlines to replace hard constraints. So if you want to if you do have a hard constraint you have to uh, maybe you have are only going to have access to a particular facility at in a certain date range, instead of putting a hard constraint on that, 
you could put in a task deadline uh, and measure that to say what's the success rate, what's the chance that we're going to meet that deadline uh, to be able to get into that uh, facility. And when we're doing an SRA, those deadlines will affect that project's success rate. Again, one of the things about having a good quality schedule, uh, we call it dangling activities. So this is making sure that all in your uh, your activities, that their network, called the precedent network, is that everything has a predecessor and a successor. Uh, obviously, if you have a um, start, the first task and the last task won't. Uh, and that way that when, the, because of risks or uncertainties, if, uh, a task expands or contracts depending on how what's happening at, on a particular iteration during the simulation that the rest of the project and all the other activities that it's linked to are going to react and change or be modified accordingly. Um, start start can uh, start start relationships can have issues and uh, as we said, so if you have a risk or an uncertainty, is it going to, is the second activity going to react accordingly? And the finish finish can have the same sort of issues. So what we want to do when we're doing our schedule, um, we're looking at our schedule qualities, we want to make sure that any changes to the schedule um, are reflected uh, accurately in the rest of uh, any changes to any activities are reflected accurately in the rest of the project so it updates correctly so next thing is about how are we going to add uncertainties and risk so uh, we like to break down what we call uncertainties and risks. uncertainties uh, I'm going to call we call it aleatory risk it's an inherent variability in all project uh, activities. Uh, one of the key things to note about it, it's irreducible. So it will occur, it's unmanageable. So it's not part of our risk management planning in, in place of that in terms of is there anything that we can do to really reduce that aleatory risk or that uh, probability distribution that it has. We just can't. Sometimes Some things are just... Uh, sometimes an activity will go shorter, sometimes it will go longer, um, and there's really, it's an in inherent sort of white noise, you might say, that uh, is part of every project, it's part of everything, that, uh, actually every sort of uh, activity that we do in our lives, uh, and we want to model that using three-point estimates. How do we get those three-point estimates? Um, reference classes, this is historical data. Uh, that you can get on similar projects and technology and activities. So if there's a historical, uh, if you have a historical database, you can go back and said uh, in the previous uh, 20 projects we've developed this type of technology and this is what the uh, data tells us uh, our probability distribution should be. Uh, you can use subject matter exports. Uh, there's all sorts of different types of ways to go into your CAMs etc. to get input into developing those three-point estimates. Um, and then uh, I've got obviously right here just a, a picture of a problem of a statistical distribution with uh, this is modeling a one-day uh, sort of a two-day most likely with a five-day pessimistic and one-day optimistic with a triangular distribution. That's just an example. And down here I've got uncertainty groups. So this is, you, you could have groups, you could characterize your risks in terms of low, medium, or high. This is, that's a very simple model uh, of doing it with coefficients. So we can uh, risk that activities have a low level of uncertainty in it. We would uh, apply these coefficients to the base duration, the most likely duration, to calculate low and high. Uh, typically, I've just used a very simple one for with three levels. I've seen uh, levels five and up to nine different groups, levels of uncertainty groups, and really that's uh, about how mature your organization is and the type of data that you have to support that type of grouping. Uh, 
The other thought about it is where is your, where is your uh, risk data going to reside? So in terms of this type of data, um, <clears throat> is are you going to have the low and high, uh, I'll call the distributions, uh, estimates, are they going to exist in, uh, if you've got a Microsoft project schedule, are you going to have them here? Or are you going to uh, add that data, uh, in our case, in Risky Project? So if you're using our add-in, for example, you will need to set aside uh, two, col duration, two duration columns, and you'll need to set aside one text column to, that includes the statistical data um, that describes uh, the low and high and most likely durations in um, a set uh, value, uh, the seed number, so random random number generates, it uses a seed, and the distribution type. Um, often this is not an issue, but we do have uh, customers who will have a schedule and they are using every single text column is, is completely used up and all the duration columns are used up. So they actually have to come up and take a look at what, how they're managing their projects and making room for that data if they want to keep it in uh, Microsoft Project. The other source of risk or variance is epistemic risks or risk events or discrete, <coughs> sorry, discrete risks. These are risk events that they have a probability and impact. <coughs> uh, they're normally found in your risk register, so if you're doing qualitative risk, you've got an Excel spreadsheet, you might have something that says we have a risk and it has a <clears throat> high high probability and low impact or something. Uh, <clears throat> they will sit in that risk register. Uh, that can be modeled as part of your schedule risk assessment as well. The other side of that is that when we look at uh, risk events is that they're reducible and they're manageable. Uh, we'll, you can actually uh, decrease the impact of that risk by buying it down through risk burndown activities. It's we call it a. It's not that it's not an inherent uh, risk variance. It's be, it's because we don't have knowledge. Um, there's and there's certain uh, activities you can do to generate and buy that knowledge that will reduce that risk. Uh, one thing about the risk burn down activities, or you might call them mitigation plans, um, is that they cost both time and money. So we do have a risk that has an impact which could cost you time and money. In order to reduce that, we're going to have to <clears throat> probably spend some time and money. And hopefully the trade-off on that is that we is uh, is that it, we can spend a little time and money to reduce a possible prob big, uh, big impact of a risk. So the other thing is when we actually get into it, we've got our data in, um, we're going to run the simulations. Uh, so you might wonder well, how many iterations, and there's a lot of discussion about how many we have to do, how many you have to do. Uh, what we have found through our own investigations is as long as there's not any sort of very low um, low probability but extremely high impact risks, uh, running uh, anywhere between 400 to 600 um, iterations during a simulation, you won't find anything. After that, there's not a lot of statistical uh, significance in any of the changes, so you won't see many changes. So if you're running anything over that, it's really about uh, what we see is if you run a thousand or two thousand iterations, you're looking a at the boundary levels. If you want to see what the very uh, very optimistic or very pessimistic um, sort of that pass that P90 or P95 and P5, so right out of the boundary. So if you're measuring out there running a uh, higher level of iterations makes sense or you want to have uh, fill in have a more filled in charts and so often that will smooth out your uh, histograms or your cumulative probability ch charts um, and it could be purely for um, 
those purposes. Or, or like I said, if you're looking at the boundary level. Other than that, really, you just need to run between four to six hundred iterations, and you will you will get a uh, valid analysis. Uh, we often get talked about what, what kind of hardware do you need. Well, we say minimum four gig, gigabytes of RAM on your machine. Um, with the uh, with the development of software and hardware over the last you know, in my experience over the last 10 years, uh, we don't need a, you don't need a supercomputer anymore, uh, but uh, if you've got a uh, schedule with several thousand activities and with some risks, your Pentium, old reliable Pentium 2 isn't going to cut it. Um, you probably, if you are running large schedules, uh, master schedules that have uh, multiple sub-projects, um, I think it's worth the investment to get uh, uh, to invest in a, um, a computer for that particular to run those that has adequate RAM, maybe eight gigs of gigabytes of RAM, <coughs> and uh, uh, you know multiple core. Especially in ours, we have multiple. Uh, we do multiple threading now on our on on during the simulations, so that will greatly increase that, the speed of that. Uh, so you could run, uh, rather than maybe 10 minutes on a very large schedule, you can bring it down to five minutes. So when we're generating reports, and this is part of when, uh, when you're starting out as well, you want to identify what type of reports you're going to, uh, you're going to uh, develop, you want to generate as part of your reporting. Um, are you going to be reporting on finish time or duration, which are very common? Are you going to use histograms, which is that sort of peak chart? We'll have a show some examples of that. Or a cumulative probability, which is that S curve. Uh, sensitivity analysis, a tornado chart, just to identify key drivers. Or even scatter plots, which is uh, which are. Uh, can be used to show show how the uh, particular activities are um, correlated duration or start or finish times of particular activities are correlated with the project or how that project correlates with that um, and report formats um, how, how are you going to report that are you going to uh, we have what we call a statistics report which provides a quick and standard chart so if you want to uh, cumulative probability and a histogram and a um, sensitivity to finish time for particular activities, it will pump that out fairly quickly and actually throw it into uh, PowerPoint for you. Uh, or are you going to have custom reports? So you can take the data or, or do you want to take a, make a custom report, grab specific charts, cut and paste them into a particular format. Um, are you going to save these to, uh, are you going to take your data and save to a file? Uh, so those are the things you have to consider about when you're, uh, when you're going to be generating your reports. Um, and again, that comes from what reports you are is what your objectives you've set at the beginning. So with that in mind, we'll take a quick look at a sort of a demonstration. Now, I what I've opened up here is just <clears throat> is a, a Microsoft project, and right here is we have uh, a very simple example that I use. You might, if you've been in a uh, presentation before, you might have seen seen this uh, this example, um, and it, it has a and you can see we have duration one, duration two, and so the data that we need to run a simulation is we need a low for a schedule risk assessment. We need a low and a high. Most likely is your duration and a low and a high. Uh, we've got some cost in here, but we're not going to look at that. And, and we set that in Microsoft Project. We map that with duration one, duration two. And I, I did mention this uh, distribution for duration. So what that does is it tells us what that does is it tells us um, <clears throat> what 
where what kind of distribution we're going to have and the seed number we set that so when you're setting up your Microsoft project you've got or you've got a schedule and you want to keep the data in here you got to make sure that you have one one two and a text field available Now we'll just go over to Risky Projects. I've actually taken this over and brought this across. So when we go into, you've got your data, and you can see right now I've uh, we set up our data here, and right now we don't have any uncertainties. <clears throat> and I haven't added any risks. But what I've done, uh, I've actually added what I call a risk level. And this tells us, and you can see we have a low, medium, and high. I've just got a text field. And what, I, what this allows me to do is go in and do a search and a find and quickly assign my low and high coefficients to an activities based on how I've characterized them on this risk level. On the project options, we can go to the calculation, and you can see right here is I've set a 1,000, which is a nice easy number, um, and I've got this is what's called convergence. I've got that turned off because uh, um, if I wanted to set convergence, I, I want it to run 1,000 because I think that gives us a nice. Uh, uh, the charts are a bit more filled in and it will run a nice round number but if I want to stop simulations when converge convergence will during we when we run the simulation it will at each iteration it's monitoring the calculations and if it sees uh, that there's no longer any statistical uh, change statistical significant changes to the standard deviation of duration over 20 simulations by this percentage, it will stop, it will consider it converge. So it's looking at the sort of statistical significance of changes and over time it will get smaller and smaller and then we can set this and say, okay, at this point it will converge. Normally we see convergence on most, on most schedules, as I mentioned, between four and 600. And the other side is what are we looking for P and this is right here if we're looking at this. So when we look at our results, these are not inputs, but when we look at the results and we see low and high, this is telling us what they mean. This is their set at P80. By default, uh, we have P10, P90, but we're looking at P80 because that's going to allow us to quickly say uh, what, what our schedule margin should be set at. So we'll just do quickly, we can go to find, and I believe it's text level one, and equals low, we'll say select all, or we'll find, and we can go here, and uh, based on what we had for low level was 0.95 and 1.1, 1 .1, oh, one and we're going to give it a triangular distribution um, one of the things I hadn't mentioned is why uh, what sort of distribution should be used uh, have this discussion all the time uh, triangular is um, what I call the the uh, should be your default unless you have data to suggest otherwise so if you uh, it's simple to use uh, it uh, allows you to maintain your model uh, easily, uh, quite easily, and you're not, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's easy to understand. What it does, uh, the, if the benefits of that, it's easy to maintain, easy to understand. The other side of that, it, it tends to add a little bit more weight on the edges than some of the other distributions that you might use. 
again, uh, I would say 90 to 95% of uh, the uh, distributions that I see being used, especially on schedule risk uh, assessment, um, are triangular. So we can now go back in and text one and we can say, medium find and oh I did not do that okay that's what I and we'll go back in and now we have those we're going to select those as a group and we will enter in point eight and and now we'll go in and we will go high. Ooh. We have a lot of high. And that is set low high duration. And that is 0.6. And two. And if you're asking, does that seem a little large, or are these typical um, for low, or or, or uh, that's a sort of a reasonable one? On the high level, if you see very high, um, I've seen uh, sort of a high, sort of pessimistic, used up to 3.5. Especially if you're in an R&D environment where you're doing things you've never done before. Uh, you'd be surprised that the data suggests that the uncertainty level of uncertainty is probably a lot higher than you would imagine. So we've added those uncertainties, and if we look at it, we can go down and hmm. Let me go back in and oh, and that's what I sort of going to have to go back in and do all that once more. And we will do the last one. I just on those ones, I had forgotten to select a particular um, option. And right here. So I'd actually had these uh, set low and high duration. So that uh, kind of. And so you can start to see that we have now added some uncertainty here. We take a quick look. We can look at how that distribution is for duration. We can see it's got a triangular. If you wanted to, again, you can start to tr you can start to play with those. If you do, again, my recommendation is unless you have uh, reason, some historical data to suggest otherwise, uh, triangular is really the good. Uh, I call it the the good enough uh, solution. Once we've added that, we can start to look at maybe adding risks. And I'm going to quickly just add generic risk. And just because we're doing an SRA, I'm not going to go get uh, uh, deeply into the risk management aspect of this in terms of pre and post mitigation. Uh, but you should know that if you have a risk, you can add additional information about that risk. Uh, to each one of these, including mitigation waterfall, which is sort of risk planning, risk reviews, history, and different properties about that risk, which are really uh, more in the venue of uh, our purview of the risk management rather than the risk analysis. 
And so we've added uh, three different risks. Now in Risky Project, we provide what we call a uh, risk register, uh, sorry, a drag and drop risk. And let me just go back to the schedule and clear that. We have drag and drop risk. And what this does is allow us to quickly assign risk to the risk schedule so we can, we can account for that epistemic risk. So I'm just going to assign this risk here to these summary activities. And what you can see, it actually adds it to all of the activities uh, activities underneath those summary activities. We give it a chance of occurring. And here we'll give a, an, a relative delay and an outcome of 20%. So there's 50% chance it will occur. And if it does, there will be a relative delay of 20%. Now I'm just going to open up one other I'm just going to enable a, a distribution curve for the risks. So for risk two, I'm going to add them to the two construction activities. <clears throat> and we'll give that a chance of 25, 1 in 4 relative income. And now you can see actually and now I have a low high. So I can actually apply a distribution to the risk outcome. And here I'm going to say that it has a good impact by 5 and here by 10 and 20. So we have a triangular distribution on the risk impact. And as you notice, they're all um, uh, all of the risks will be associated with that now. And it's going to ooh, now did that. Sorry, I'm just going to make sure that 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 the risk was assigned to that. Okay, just hasn't calculated yet. And finally, um, I'm going to assign a fixed risk delay to here. And so we on one, I'm going to say it has a 75% chance it's going to occur. And we're going to say it's a fixed delay of between one let's say between 10 and 1 days and we'll leave that a okay i'm probably going to now kill this <clears throat> I put them in in the wrong order. I apologize. I'll just close this and restart it. Just go quickly do this one more time uh, and risk three. Uh, on that last one, we'll, we'll give that and then we'll do the construction. Construction. And we'll say that is a 25% chance of occurring relative delay and 
five, 20, and we'll make it triangular. And lastly, we'll do a fixed delay on right here. There we go. And we'll say there's a 75% chance of a fixed delay. And now we can see that turns to days and we call that uniform and we'll go from 10 to zero, we'll call it one day. <clears throat> one and zero. And once we've done that, uh, we've got our model now, we have our risks and we can ch check the risk assignments here. This is telling us how they've been assigned to all the activities. If we go into the risk, again it tells us in the risk register how that's assigned. We do have our three-point estimates we've put in. So now all that's left is to run a simulation and we've run that simulation. Now in the analysis Uh, what we have here is what we call our risk adjusted schedule in the result Gantt. And this tells us right here, here's our, uh, what we call the current original and these are our results. So there's the mean, the low and the high and remember that we had set the high at uh, result at P80. If we wanted to, we call that high duration, we could call that P80. And what does the P80 tell us? Uh, we can put that as also as a, start, as a uh, finish, high finish start time. And it tells us where we should be setting our, our uh, schedule margin. So we can use that, the difference between our original and our P80 right here, the margin here is 0.2 days, so it's about 10%. And we can go down that on every single uh, uh, particular activities that we might want to put the schedule margin on. Obviously, we're not going to put margin on each activity. Uh, the best practice is to create a added margin, schedule margin activities into your plan so that it builds out to that P80 time. Each one of those, we want to go to the project summary. Project summary tells us <clears throat> what's happening at the project level. Uh, we do have some cost in here, but for finish time, uh, schedule risk analysis, we're looking at, we have our original project of start duration and finish time versus our results. And we can see our mean is, uh, at the mean we've added about, you know, two weeks. Um, again, We've added two weeks here. At the P80, we've added another, almost another week on top of that. Uh, when we look at that, we can pull out any of the data if we want to do it at the project time. Generally, during project planning, uh, this is, uh, we'll be looking at the overall project data in terms of finish time, what's most likely, so we can look at our <clears throat> When we look at our deterministic, which was just uh, there, we go. Deterministic was right around there's July, so we'll be sort of right around down here. Um, you see our original project plan. We have almost no chance of getting June fourteenth. Uh, June 15th, so, okay, sorry, just move it out, June 15th, uh, we have a 1% chance, uh, but if we can shift that over, to here, add three, three more weeks onto, oh, 81 cents, so if we add three more weeks onto that, onto our uh, projects plan, 
uh, will have an 80% chance of finishing it on time. The other side of that is that we're looking at sensitivity analysis, and these are what are our main drivers. This is looking at risks. This is telling us what our most critical risks are. But if we wanted to look at task duration for the, what are the main drivers for finishing the project, we can see that. Or if we wanted to look at finish time, again, develop code. So this is our these are our main activities that we'll want to keep our eyes on, and we can generate reports out of that. Any of the reports that we have out of, let's say, this view, we can have ad hoc reports that are going to bring that up. So you can include these as a sensitivity analysis report directly out of, uh, out of the views that you have here. The result Gantt allows us to take a look at any of these activities and let me just go and modify column. <clears throat> and what I've done in here, um, I've added this RPT, which means those are the ones that I, uh, activities that I want to report on. And that gives me an identifier that I can then, uh, if I want to, I can take a look at the results for that activity here. So these are detailed, so duration or finish time. Again, we've seen a, a weekend. But we can start to get the results and generate reports based on these uh, particular activities that we have or milestones. So all of this data is available at the project level. Again, project level is probably around the planning. If you have a long, pro a long project that's, let's say, going over a year or so, um, sort of recommend that you start to look at the major deliverables that you have in your project you're, that you're going to focus on because a year's, year or two years can be a long ways out. Um, and really, you want to have, be looking at that short and middle term when you're doing running these reports to see when these milestones, uh, uh, what the uh, finish time, probable finish times are, the confidence levels on those finish times, and how that's changing over time. So once we've developed and run the simulation, we ran again. We ran this a uh, hundred times. We have a. Uh, we want to do some reports on that. Um, we have a project dashboard that is a really, if you wanted to give a really high level look at what's, uh, what the main project parameters are, what are the most crucial tasks, which are the activities that are going to most affect your project. And as we noticed, we saw develop code was the one in terms of project duration. And three most critical risks uh, we have two risks in here. And these are the ones that are telling us so the risks that we need to manage. And we might be going into and doing some uh, management to reduce those risks. Uh, task sheet, again, this can be an ad hoc. And if we want to print out of here, we can change any of these activities and put in the durations, uh, any sort of uh, results that we get out of the system. We can put those in. And we can generate an ad hoc report, again, simply by setting up the grid and, and doing a print preview, and it will generate that. The other side of that is we have the statistics report. And what is the statistics report? So I'm going to go back in here. I don't want to have that. I'm going to go modify column. I'm going to call that. text three. Now that we're in here, so the statistics report, if I click and I select one of that, it generates a quick report. And we can set up that report. And then this one, I've got a combined frequency and cumulative probability, which you can see right here. There's a, a chunky sort of S-curve there along with the histogram. Uh, I want to include my percentiles and statistics as, as long, uh, with that. 
Um, and as well, I have, uh, I'm going to use a PowerPoint, so I'm going to show you how we can do that. We can set up which, uh, which data do we want to look at. While I'm looking for my SRA, I'm going to use finish time, and I'm going to show a sensitivity to finish time. I think we've got that. Okay. Um, and if we want to, you can print that. You can print this out. Go to the file menu up here. And we can do a print preview. And this can be printed out if you want to put it on a plotter, put it out as PDF, and then put it on a portal. So you can print it out directly from here. Or we can send it out to uh, PowerPoint. Now, one of the things is which which activities you want. Well, we've we've identified these are the activities that we want to do the report on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the schedule and I'm going to do the same thing again. And I'm going to go and I'm going to look in the field here. And this shows the fields that are available and equals and I'm going to put RPT find it's going to select those and now that's part of the report so if we go back to the print preview we now have all of these activities that we can report on so we quickly generate a report now if we want to uh, take that to a PowerPoint And up here in the professional version, we have a statistics to PowerPoint. And we just click that. And there we go. And it quickly, oh, it quickly sends the report data. Well, don't save. I'm just going to make sure that. Like, oh, okay. And there we go. Okay. Um, and we can send that to a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So it allows us to quickly go through uh, and quickly generate the reports that you want. And really what you're going to do uh, especially if you send it to uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, uh, you're going to put some narrative around that. What what did it is? What are the differences we've seen from the previous report? If there's any shifts, et cetera, et cetera. So this time, I'd like to thank uh, everyone. I'm going to just go quickly through and see if we have any questions here. And so I have one. Does this connect to Primavera P6 or direct or XE file? Um, it we actually uh, if we go back in here, we actually uh, use the XML file. We import by an XML. We call it Microsoft Project um, P6. Uh, P6 supports the Microsoft Project XML, and it's actually uh, coming from the uh, Oracle um, consultants themselves. They recommend using the uh, Microsoft uh, XML import or integration rather than the XER now. Uh, they believe it's more robust. Okay, uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. With that, I'd like to thank you, uh, everyone who's attended. If you do have any questions, um, please feel free uh, to contact me directly. Michael Tromper, uh, here's my email and our, our number. Uh, we do have a lot of white papers and articles 
on our uh, site. Uh, we have a new online tutorial that's coming up. We're still uh, releasing additional uh, videos as we go on. And we have what's called Project Decisions Online, which is a, uh, a non-commercial resource that includes a lot of links to various project risk and decision analysis uh, resources that are available on the web to help you out with your uh, schedule risk assessment or project risk management uh, problems. Uh, thank Okay, uh, well thank you very much uh, for your time. I hope you were able to uh, find something useful. If you do, like I said, if you do have some questions, please feel free to contact me offline. I'd be happy to talk with you uh, about any questions you might have.